session. Um, and hopefully you can all see, we're going to have 20 minutes of input from Michelle, and then we're going to um, have questions. So, take it from there. Okay, so tough, tough act to follow, but I'll, I'll try my best. Uh, so, Michel Tamados, uh, I'm very honored and, and pleased to talk about the melting Arctic and the slightly overwhelming question of what will it mean. Uh, so, it, it was a bit of sleep last night, uh, last night, but I will try my best. Um, I'm a doctor at the University of Reading in the Center for Polar Observation and Modeling. Before that, I was also at CIPO at UCL. And, uh, I'm in the Department of Meteorology at the University of Reading, very exciting place. Uh, there is another workshop with um, a researcher from there. So my my course, uh, current project is funded by NERC and it's part of the larger consortium of the environment of the Arctic, climate, ocean, and sea ice. Uh, it's a project uh, led by Sheldon Bacon at the National Ocean Oceanography Center in uh, Southampton. So, and, and the aim is to understand, better understand the coupling between the atmosphere and the ocean in the Arctic region through the uh, very thin layer, but uh, insulating layer that the Arctic sea ice is. And uh, I will, uh, my talk will be slightly biased towards sea ice, which is my domain of expertise. And in the second part, I will talk more about some of the potential implications of the sea ice melting. So uh, climate is changing. It's changing rapidly. Uh, there is strong evidence that humans uh, have caused most of this uh, temperature increase. But it's quite interesting to see that the, the temperature anomalies this is the difference between uh, the temperature between 2000 and 2009 and the average of between 50 and 80. So the, the, the anomalies are, are very heterogeneous. So there's a strong uh, increase of like, 2 degrees in the Arctic as opposed to the average of 0 0.6 degrees since the 50s. Uh, so this is called Arctic amplification. So what has really caused that is, is uh, still debatable. One, one uh, clear contribution is the so-called uh, uh, Arctic albedo feedback mechanism. So as the sea ice is retreating dramatically, more heat is, the, the sea ice is white, okay? and it's very reflective. So when it retreats, it's replaced by oceans that are darker, absorbs sunlight, makes the ocean uh, warm and the environment warmer, melts more sea ice, and there's this loop that is kind of uh, catastrophic and deep, and is one, com one contribution to the, the Arctic amplification. So uh, what, what do we... What, what, this has obviously impact on the Arctic region. By Arctic, uh, I mean uh, the definition of whatever is north of uh, 66 degree north. This is a region where uh, there is a uh, polar summer. So there are a few days in the, in the year where there will be no, no day or there will be no night. So in this area, like this. Uh, so in these regions, you have uh, Arctic Ocean, that is most of the year and now not in the summer in the winter definitely uh, covered by ice, so the, the ocean is frozen. I, I want to make the distinction between the sea ice, well, the ice that's on Greenland and the ice that is here. This is a very thin layer in the ocean, frozen ocean, typically two meters. These are hundreds of kilometers thick ice in Greenland. So often people get confused and it, they say, how is it going to disappear in a few years if it's a thousand meters thicker? Yeah. So it's very different, Greenland, ice sheets and sea ice. My, my, my research focuses on, physical, on the physical processes of evolving sea ice. So I'll start talking about that, but it's important to realize that the, the, the Arctic amplification has already shown signs, the important signs. The, the clear is the decline of sea ice, I will come back to this. But there are also uh, impacts on glacier retreat, uh, very strong glacier retreat in Alaska throughout the Arctic. Uh, permafrost, permafrost warming and thawing is another important impact of uh, temperature rise in this region. Less snow. Uh, uh, ice, uh, river and, uh, and lake ice is melting, and, and, and also an important and accelerating melting of the Greenland ice sheet. Is, is so, and, and also ocean surface warming, as there is more heat captured by the ocean, is, 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 is measured to be warm. So, uh, okay. So this is uh, an important thing. Another important thing to, to, to realize that the Arctic is. It's not this remote place only for polar explorers, almost a different planet. It's part of our system. It, it's all uh, part of the same uh, climate system. It's also a place that where 4 million people uh, live, their indigenous population. There's a very large biodiversity, the species that are specific only found in this region, the most famous, probably the polar bear. Uh, and uh, there are lots of mechanisms that are uh, a myriad of feedback mechanisms that take place. A lot of research is going on. A lot of these things need to be understood. For example, 
the winds and the ocean current will uh, affect the distribution of yeah, it's very strong and very small but from you see it takes a lot of the, the area. This in turn the distribution of sea ice will affect back uh, our feedback on the currents in the ocean and therefore alter the, the potentially alter the climate and the weather at uh, even on the <coughs> mid latitude range. So this is something it's important to realize and also more and more there are uh, commercial uh, interest uh, geopolitical interest in this region and with this come a, a series of risks, oil spills, uh, shipping risks and so on and this is something so human influences the Arctic and the Arctic can influence uh, the humans back so this is also something uh, quite important but it's important to, to look at it as an integral part of the climate system and, and it, see us and the Arctic, uh, these phenomena are now currently in the general circulation model they will try and capture as much of the physics here so, I, I, I'm going to show a quick animation, quick movie, quick tech, showing the, the sea ice. This, is, this animation was produced by, to commemorate the 2010 launch of the Cryosat uh, satellite mission, uh, where the UK has a lot of uh, contribution, and it shows the September ice extent. So, September is the minimum. There is a cyclic uh, a cycle in sea ice extent between. March, where it will reach a very large area in September. The area covered by sea ice is typically the size of Europe on average, or the United States. And, and you see here how from 2000, uh, let's try and stop, this was the minimum in 2007. You see that from, two, from 1978 to 2007, there's been a reduce of about 40%, so quite dramatic in sea ice extent, leaving all this uh, Baffle Sea uh, uncovered in other regions. If you continue, continue this animation until 2010, you see that there is internal variability, but all, overall, the last six years have been the, the, the short, smallest extent uh, record ever recorded, consecutive years. And 2012 was actually the, the largest, um, the, the absolute minimum. So if I go back to the presentation, normally it was intended, but we do not this time. Just to be uh, co complete, Often in September you have a big media uh, thing about the, we've, have we reached the new CS minimum? So that's September CS extent. These are data from, from the NSIDC from last year, 2020, so the absolute minimum. But you have to realize that in March it, it, it grows back to not exactly what it was in the 70s, but close. So the decline in March is not as strong. So often climate uh, denies, climate change denies, we use that as, a, as an example of how the CS. It's not so big deal, it, it, it recovers. But this is hiding a lot of the information. In fact, you have to look at the volume of ice. This is just the extent. If there was a thin layer of ice, it wouldn't mean anything. So it's important to keep that in mind. How do models perform? How do the, the, the models that uh, Kevin talked about, the, the, the huge uh, inter international uh, effort, there's tens of models that are part of this IPCC uh, report that uh, Kevin mentioned starting in the 80s. All this effort, uh, tries to, to capture various things, various components of the climate. CS is a small part of this. And, and, and you see that this is a famous plot from 2007, the previous assessment. Observation of September CS extent, very strong decrease of the extent. Models, very wide range of values for the CS extent. An average that completely misses the trend. So you can say they don't perform so well. The new set of models, as, the, as Kevin said, every five years or so, there are uh, an assessment of the performance of the model. That's just, remember, it's a small part of the model. The CS extent for, for most people is, is very relevant, but uh, for the polar research is quite important. And they do a better job, even if you can say that 2012, uh, they kind of missed the trend. The problem is that they, this is, again, the extent, and you should look at the volume. I will come back, uh, come, come back to this now. Another uh, aspect that shows that models and the physics of CS is not so well captured by the models is if you try to predict there's a game in the community every year we try to say in June what's going to be the Arctic, Arctic sea ice extent and, and a series of groups try that and try I think it's now you can, you can participate I think there's also probably for the public everybody can try but here's a group research group that tried to predict the 2012 minimum and they all missed it this was the absolute minimum that you see here in September they all missed it by at least 10% so it shows that the physics must be a little bit wrong in the sea ice at least and possibly in the way it's coupled with the atmosphere and the ocean. What about this here? This is 
I download this is is a very strong community, very active community. You can get the data from today. I mean, this is three three days ago, uh, and we see the 2013 trend with extent. So kind of close to the 2012 absolute minimum. What's going to happen? We claim that by improving the physics, you can have a better understanding of short-term predictions. This has a different uh, uh, potential interest, commercial, but also uh, for the climate and to try and better understand the climate. So that's another thing. Here I would like to, um, to say that there has been a very important breakthrough recently. I mentioned Cryosat. Cryosat 2 is a satellite, European sat satellite, that was uh, launched in 2010 10 successfully. The first launch was a failure, it crashed, but the second was successful. And that's very good because now, for the first time, we have an ice thickness map. So before we were seeing the extent, and now we see also how thick the ice is. This is the scale you can see, I think it's five meters, <coughs> zero to five meters. So just the average is about two meters, so it's a thin layer of ice. It's very important, and it extends to 88 degrees north. So uh, this is a, an enormous achievement, and I, I, I want to pay tribute to these two researchers that you probably you've seen in the news died tragically this year. I used to work with these two guys, and Dr. Kathleen Giles and Professor Sam Lassiter, the leading researchers from, from this year, and have, have really contributed to this work, and some of the work I will show later. And uh, a lot of researchers that work with them uh, pay a lot. Thank them for their for the help and their, their inspiration. So this is going to be a, is a breakthrough in our understanding of how this sea ice thickness has changed and the total volume. Of it. If you have the area and the thickness, you have the total volume of ice. And this has confirmed the picture that was already uh, understood that sea ice is, sh is shrinking, is, is thinning dramatically. And the total volume, comp the Arctic, I told the extent reduced by 40 percent from 78 to 2010 the volume has, has reduced by 75%. So this was also based on experiments from submarines, uh, airborne data, in-situ data, and that has co confirmed this, this result. But if you want a full coverage and a trend, you have to, to go back to the 70s, and the best bet to do this is to take a model. But that's not a GCM, it's a model that, is, that assimilates data, so it tries to reproduce as closely as possible. It doesn't try to predict the future, but it tries to capture the CIS characteristics. And, and this is a model called PIMAS, and it has been shown to validate the observations. And if you follow this trend from the 78, now this is a volume in, in uh, thousands of kilometers cube. You see that the volume is decaying very rapidly. So from 78 to now, there's 75% decrease. This is coherent with the observation. And some people, this is more a statistical approach. So this is the, the trend status, what they call, I guess, the model is kind of debate. Uh, it's a, it was kind of hit a debate in, in a few years, so definitely before 2020, when the models tend to predict the Hadley Center, the Met Office model, have a longer uh, prediction of after 2040. So there is a little gap uh, to bridge uh, there, a bit. And, and part of the, the answer will come from better representation of CS. Uh, but it's important to have that in mind that the models are slightly failing in capturing the, the trend of the, of the CS. Eh? I think most models now are aware of them. Oops, I see stuff. Okay, the, the media, ah, that's, that's the last animation. If I can get it. So just to, to, to close this uh, picture of the Arctic sea ice melting, I'm going to show this animation. So this is uh, something based on observation, showing again from the 78 to, to today, what's, what has happened to the Arctic. And, and this is a, it's not the thickness, but it's the age of the Arctic. So the age you will notice is very young. Most of the ice in the Arctic is less than 10 years old. There is a lot of uh, dynamics in the Arctic. It's, it's, uh, it's moved around. White regions are older ice, so typically more than nine years old. This is multi-year ice, uh, reached ice, thicker ice. And the light blue is first year ice. So it's ice that has melted in the summer and is advanced. it has grown, grown, grown again in the winter. And, uh, that's a shame because the, the end is quite good. <laughs> quite good. I mean, quite bad, quite sad. So, 2010, uh, the multi year ice is, is kind of completely gone. Because as you can say, you know, they say Arctic is still there, it's recoverable. Depending on what you look, if you look at old ice, it's almost gone already. So, partly exported out of the Arctic basin, partly melted. So, this is in a sense quite worrying. And, and, and it's also calling for new physics because. Uh, the Arctic sea ice landscape has completely changed. We need possibly to, to, to think about new physics to capture this. So this is part of my research. Uh, and um, 
this is the, the first part uh, <coughs> ending there, more or less. And now I'm going in more um, uncharted territory for me. It's, it's the question, so, what is the question? What will it mean? What does it mean? It's the distress me. It's the future. You have to understand much better. And Kevin might be better to address this. But generally, and here I will relate it more. Not, this is not my direct research, but I'm in an environment where uh, people talk, and I would, I would love to stop at some point. And that might be part, might, can be part of the discussion with you, actually. I, you might teach me more than I can teach you. But generally speaking, uh, the, the Arctic feedbacks are, have been, have been uh, summarized. The, the Arctic, the change, the melting of the Arctic, has an impact not only regionally, it is, as I said, the potential to affect the climate in general. So there are four strong groups of, of feedback mechanisms that can affect the climate. Atmospheric circulation feedback, oceanic circulation feedback, ice sheet melting, we're talking about the North Pole, and, and similar things in the Antarctic, and sea level rise feedback, as soon as the method, and finally land and marine carbon and methane hydrate feedbacks. So definitely, uh, some of these points, I'm, I'm not expert in that, but I, I try to do literature review on that. I, re I really recommend this, uh, this report from the WWF that came out about three years ago, and, and, and I, I took a lot of information from that but, and from more recent publications. So if you start by the mechanism of Arctic amplification, uh, the, the, the decline of sea ice is, 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 is already a sign of this Arctic amplification. And, and we already see signs of the increased temperature, as I've shown in the first slide. The climate models predict that this trend is going to continue, particularly dramatically in the winter. So this is the different months of the year, up to 2100. This is an average of all the climate models of the previous assessment. And you see an increase of temperature in the winter, typically up to 14 degrees. And that's the new uh, results from the new models that have been improved from the new CIMIT 5. CIMIT 5 is the Couple model intercomparison of the spice, so that's the current one. You see the trend in, in temperature in the Arctic, and that's the average of the temperature increase over the next 100 years. And you see a trend of 0 to 2 degrees per, per year. That's 20 <coughs> degrees in 100 years, is an enormous increase of temperature in the winter. So uh, uh, that's four times stronger than in the summer, by the way. So a very strong winter increase of temperature in the Arctic. And that of course, it's going to have a strong impact on the climate. It's a new feature, a new system in the, in the climate model. It's going to, it's, it has to have an impact. So that's uh, a lot of interest get, got, got interested, are interested in that. There are publications now coming up. One that, that has raised the, the potential impact of this uh, change on the Western Europe climate and on the mid latitudes is the paper by Francis in, in GRN in 2012. The idea is that as you, as you go from a system where the, the, the Arctic is act as a refrigerator for the North Hemisphere, and, 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 and which is much taller than the warm mid latitude. If this is changing, then the, the pattern in the general circulation of the atmosphere is also going to change. And the way it's going to change is by the other signs of that, and that's one hypothesis is that the, the polar jet that is essentially a, a wind from the west to the, to the east that has this kind of undulating uh, uh, Rossby wave uh, shape is going to become more, has, have a larger amplitude and uh, the, the jet will be slower. So this apparently is, is uh, predicted and is already observed to, to, to result in, in, uh, in strong weather patterns including uh, extreme weather events, drought, flooding, cold spells in the winter and heat waves uh, over Europe. So this is one possible impact of this uh, situation. Uh, this is uh, ongoing research and, and, and I welcome any comments on that. Another aspect is the second, so it's the, how the ocean now, the ocean uh, circulation feedback is going to be affected by the melting of the ice and the Arctic amplification. So this is research done by Catherine Jive, uh, and she published this in Nature Geoscience last year. And essentially, what we find is that, uh, in the words of uh, Professor Duncan Wigan, head of NERC and lead the research of Chrysler, he says, we are performing the largest geophysical experiment ever in oceanog oceanography. Uh, the, essentially, we are removing uh, the sea ice. We, uh, the climate system is melting sea ice. 
And, and by doing that, we allow the, the atmosphere to do more work on the ocean and set, it, set, it, set the ocean into motion. Because you have to understand that the Arctic Ocean is kind of quiet compared to the Atlantic Ocean. The currents are much uh, less, less strong. It is a quiescent ocean. And by doing that, by removing the ice, making the ice thinner, and other things that are in Australia, we allow the, the momentum transfer from the atmosphere to the Arctic Ocean and a spin up. What has been observed in this paper is that there is a strong spin up. So sea level rise in the buffer zone through the influence of the uh, rotating uh, uh, anti cyclonic uh, winds. They are creating through Ekman pumping this sea level rise in the buffer zone that accumulates about 10% of fresh water we accumulate. Right? And one question is what happens if this fresh water, if the circulation changes direction and then is released throughout the, throughout the Arctic and potentially out of the Arctic basin. Potential importance is if, if fresh water ends up in the North Atlantic here, then there is a, a possibility that uh, European Gulf Stream and the European weather might be affected. So this is one direction of, of research that is quite uh, strong. This is better seen in the, in the next slide. So the question is, is, is this uh, melting of the ice Arctic going to affect the, what is called the overturning circulation or the thermohaline circulation? This is the general dominant pattern of how the ocean is circulating throughout the globe. And that kind of uh, defines the weather in a sense. It's a very strong, on a decadal scale, it tells you how the weather is going to be. So the important contribution comes from the Arctic region where strong, warm, uh, saline water comes from the Atlantic, uh, is the continuation of the Gulf Stream, penetrates in the, in the Arctic uh, Ocean. Yeah. A couple of minutes, you know, I will try and stop now, quite soon, two, two three minutes. And, and, and rotates uh, cyclones in an uh, anticlockwise uh, motion uh, through the effect of the <coughs> and, and, and fresh input from sea ice and, and other mechanisms, and it's, it's freshening goes deeper in the ocean and comes out again from the front straight and, 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 uh, and uh, the Barents Sea. And if this makes it, if a lot of fresh water comes from river, uh, increased river runoff, from uh, ice sheet melting, from sea ice melting, but also from the uh, strong reservoir in the Halocline. The Halocline is, a, is a 200 meters below the sea ice, there is a uh, fresh water. If this is become, becomes available, and is, is, is brought into this region, it can set up a very strongly stratified ocean with uh, less saline water on top of saline water and very stable, which could prevent uh, these uh, saline currents coming in and affect the Gulf Stream gradually. So this is one, one direction that could also impact the, the climate. What, what Kevin said before is that for the UK, maybe it's not as bad as other people. There's this kind of, uh, it's a terrible thing to say, but it, and it might be wrong, which is really good. But the, the climate is less warming. That, that would be possibly one, one direction. So, but they could be, you know, these are based on a climate uh, simulation. You always have to be careful. One more feedback mechanism before I, I think I will skip the last one and maybe we can talk about it. It's sea level changes uh, due to uh, ice sheets melting. So that's the other component. A lot of research is going on. Cryosat is going to contribute. And uh, we can measure very precisely how the ice sheets in Greenland and Antarctica are melting and how much we contribute to sea level rise. I think it's very useful to put things sometimes in perspective of the, of the you know, uh, one million years. We are very here, very warm. We are here in a very warm period. So uh, Sir Brian Hoskins from the Department of Meteorology in Reading would say that we're in a warm room and we put the heating on. It's a bit of a dangerous place to be, particularly the last uh, interglacial period was uh, 120,000 years ago, so 140,000 years ago a bit warmer, two, three degrees warmer. That's where we tend to. And, and we know from, uh, from different studies that if we go there, three or two or three degrees warmer in Greenland, Greenland is going to melt. It's a question of time, maybe 1,000 years, maybe 500 years, depending. Again, there are tipping points, there are non-linearity, so you have to be very careful uh, about what you say. But if this happens, the Greenland melts, it has the potential for seven meter sea level rise. This is not for tomorrow, but it's good to have the the idea of the potential. And Antarctica has a potential for 55 meters. That, that, has, that is, has never happened uh, within uh, 100,000 years. But, but here, uh, the sea level was higher. It was about five, I think, five, six meters high. So this is somewhere, the steady state would be that, from our understanding. And, and recent measure, again, from Chrysler, 
there, there was a paper very well at the time, very well in the video, telling how much the sea level rise is as changed to Greenland. It's a few millimeters per, per year, and people were denied, oh, well, one millimeter per year, or three millimeters per year, that's nothing. But that's, that's one centimeter associated to, to, to Greenland every 20 years. <coughs> Remember, that's for the last 20 years where the temperature hasn't risen so much. That's my understanding. So one centimeter, add four centimeters of uh, expansion of the ocean is five, multiplied by, by, by five times, it's already 25 meters of sea level rise on average. And this is not going to happen in the same way everywhere. So even 25 centimeters, and that's a conservative estimate. Obviously. So this is something to, that's very important. And I think I, I might have to, I've already overrun that quite a bit. So the, the last one is the, I'm sorry for those who are very interested in that, but is marine, uh, Marine carbon cycle feedbacks, and there's also uh, land carbon uh, cycle feedbacks, and also methane uh, hydrate carbon uh, <laughs> cycle feedbacks that I, I don't have time to go into. And finally, there are a few slides on uh, geoengineering, uh, should we consider it? But uh, maybe we can keep this in, in a kind of discussion, uh, because I know some people are interested in that, but it's not my expertise of the kind of It's a blog spot associated with this, and it's been put up, you know, that too. <coughs> <coughs> is, is anybody able to take notes from the session? Brilliant, thank you. Just sort of get an idea of some of the questions that were asked. Mm -hmm. and, um, I could put this presentation on my website. Mm -hmm. That would be great. Yeah. You say where? Yeah. Um, it's my um, name. <laughs> okay. I'm um, just too much. Great. I'm not too much. I'm not too much. Sam Kurana. Um, Arctic views, or 